Welcome to the Business Made Me Do It podcast, where we cover business, marketing, and overall growth. I am your host, Caleb Shore, as you heard in the intro. I co-founded Conversion Stream, a digital ad advertising agency built for the small brick and mortar business. Today, we got a great guest for you guys, Jared Orton. He's the president of the Savannah Bananas, a member of the Coastal Plain League, if you guys aren't familiar with uh, the baseball environment, is a collegiate league one of the top tier collegiate leagues in the in the U.S. at least. Um, they have sold out every single game for four straight seasons, which is unheard of in, in this environment. Um, you guys are focused on creating experience for your fans that get them talking. Jared, welcome to the show, man. Hey, Caleb. Um, first off, I, how did you come up with the name of the podcast? Because I, I, I laughed as soon as I saw <laughs> it. Like, that, is a, that is a cool name. Honestly, one of my buddies, Zach Wright, I put a Instagram questionnaire out. I'm like, hey, I'm creating a podcast. It's going to be about <laughs> these three things. So it was a user submission, man. That was I, cool. I, I, like I cannot it. take credit for that whatsoever. Business made um, me do it. I dig it. Yeah. So I had about 10 different people reach out with different um, ideas. Yeah. And as soon as he said that, I was like, that's it. That's it. I, I, I did not create it, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> all right cool, man. man so uh yeah we heard a little bit about you in the intro um yeah. give us kind of a rundown you know what you guys are up to a little bit about yourself and we'll kind yeah. of go from there yeah so yeah i mean savannah bananas it, it's been it's been this crazy kind of uh whirlwind of you know four going into our fifth season here and i mean the, the best way i can ever describe it for people is like we're a baseball team and a circus and it all comes together and collides and chaos comes out of it and you know people people compare it to maybe like oh uh, are you guys like the globe trotters like kind of like there's like this showmanship-esque thing but it's also like we're a real baseball team these are like the top college players from across the country and so there's that like okay was well, it like wwe where it's all scripted out like no like it definitely is kind of scripted out but like we're going to win. We're going to lose. Like there's going to be all these crazy things that happen. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the, the best way I can describe it is like, it's a circus and a baseball game breaks out and you might know the score. You might not know the score, um, you know, dancing players and, and senior citizen dance teams and, you know, banana nanas and like all these crazy things. You know, we, we've worn kilts twice in a baseball game and we've won. <laughs> Um, you know, everything's on video, everything's on social media, everything is, is recorded and put out. Um, and it's been a lot of fun, but you know, it didn't start that way. And, and I think, you know, sometimes people can see like, oh, this, this company, this business is doing like, you know, so many cool things and selling all these games and all this stuff. But like when we first started and it was just four of us, you know, working off of a picnic table in this office that I'm sitting in right here, you know, right out this door, we have the picture of, of literally us on a picnic table, you know, carpet's been ripped out, phone lines have been ripped out, no internet, we're on our cell phones making calls. Um, it was a struggle in the beginning because, you know, nobody knew who we were, nobody knew what we were about. The previous team, the, the, the minor league team that was here had left, they had left the town, they had left the stadium, they said that, you know, baseball shouldn't exist anymore. Baseball's dead. The fans won't come. The stadium sucks. All that stuff had been said. And so you can imagine uh, we come in, this little college, you know, summer baseball team, and nobody knows who they are. And we start calling people saying, you know, we're the new team in town. And people were like, what? Like, what is this? Who are you? Why are you calling me? I thought baseball was gone from here. And so, you know, those first few months when we started, um, I think we sold like four season tickets wow. and like one sponsorship package in like four or five months. Like it was a grind and we were just trying to market like everyone else. We were just trying to sell, 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 sell like everyone else. We were trying to put ads everywhere. We were trying to, you know, create all these packages and put them out to people and send emails and get on social media. And we were just doing everything like everyone else. And it wasn't until we really went all in on the entertainment, the fun, being different, standing out, doing the, doing the things that people don't expect in your industry. Um, it wasn't really until we put all that into play that, that things started looking up. But it, it's, it's been a wild ride uh, these past few years. That's awesome, man. Um, how, how long, just kind of that beginning stage, how long did it take you from like start to start seeing a little traction? Yeah. 
So we got here in September of 2015. So September 2015 or October, whatever, 2015, we get going. Um, we kind of announce ourselves as community and whatnot. And then in January, we ran out of money. So like we were, we were had all, we had full time people, benefits. You know, we had the office, we had bills. Um, things weren't coming in. Tickets weren't being sold the way we wanted them to be sold. And so like we got down to like zero. And for for people who don't know, like we don't have we don't have like a bunch of investors. We didn't you know we didn't get rich somewhere else. And this is kind of our you know hide the money here in a baseball team. Like that's not it. Like this is everything that we do. And so January comes, we run out of money and our owners, Jesse and Emily Cole, they sell their house that they, they go all in on trying to like, you know, really fund this thing. Um, and then we get to February and we come out with the name and we announce to the world that we're going to be the Savannah bananas and people like, so you didn't have out. a name before that. It's pretty awkward. We were, um, so from September to February, we had this little logo. It was uh, Savannah Baseball 2016. That was our logo. Wow. And so like we would call people and be like, hey, we're the new Savannah Baseball team in town. And people were like, are you like a little league team? Are you like a softball <laughs> team? Like, who, what, what do you mean? You're the new? And we'd be like, oh, you know, like we're over at Grayson Stadium. And they're like, we thought Grayson Stadium was done. And I mean, it's just chaos. Mm. Uh, we had no identity. We had no nothing. We just had kind of these empty promises of like, hey, believe in us, right? Like, trust me, and we're going to be fun, and we're going to be different. Um, but it wasn't until we came out with that name that I think people were like, this is actually going to be different. This is going to be weird. These people are actually going to go through with this. Um, they're going to name this team the Savannah Bananas. <laughs> and it was polarizing, right? People were like, you know, you guys are idiots. You guys are geniuses. Uh, boycott the team. I'll go to all the games, you know, buy the merchandise, burn the merchandise. Like it was chaos. Um, but what we, what we realized in that moment was that we finally started getting people's attention for what we were trying to do. We were no longer just advertising to them, selling them, cold calling them. Like that was, that was, that was previous. Now they were talking about us. They were intrigued. We had their attention. We had a reason to get in touch with them. And um, that's when things started moving forward at that point. And okay, so that was, I mean, six months. Yeah. Until you named it. Then the yeah. next step, like when did the when did the real momentum start with you selling out every season? Was that a year? Yeah. Was that two years? Yeah, so it was our, so, you know, we had this vision of, of bringing this uh, entertainment baseball to Savannah. That, that was, you know, we want to bring fun. We want to bring the, the game of baseball in a fun way. We want to bring this fans first mindset. You know, we have this vision of what we want to bring. And then, you know, kind of that, that strategy and the kind of how and why and what and all that was, was really, we thought that we believe that the best, you know, baseball, best sports experience um, is a sold out experience. You know, nobody goes home and, and brags about going to a game with 10 people there. That, that's not like, a, that's not a fun, you know, nobody's taking pictures of themselves at an empty bar or an empty concert. Like, that's just not cool. Um, you're taking pictures of yourself, you know, at the, at the Superdome with a hundred thousand people there like that. That's cool. And so we wanted to create this sold out experience and we believed that if we could start selling out games, that would lead people to, you know, being more excited. This kind of like literally fear of missing out. If we could start telling people, hey, you got to get tickets early. You got to get them now. You got to get them in advance. These games sell out. The demand is high. You know, games have never sold out at Grayson Stadium. This is brand new. This is exciting. We thought that would lead us down a path of more games selling out. And so our target was, I believe, could we sell out five games? That was, that was the mindset was like, if we could sell out like opening night, you know, the fireworks show, 4th of July, the last game, you know, so all, if we could sell out four or five games, then this thing would be something. And so that first game sold out. And this is the power of telling people no. That first game sold out. And we, we, we shouted to the masses, 
can't come, sold out, can't get <laughs> tickets, sorry, you missed like all those things. The media is blowing it up. And immediately the tickets for the next night started flooding it. People just started buying tickets for the next night. And all of a sudden, opening night sells out, the second night sells out. And then as soon as we announced this night sold out, the third night started rolling in. And we saw this model kind of taking place of like, if you really commit to selling things out, creating this unreal demand and telling people we're done, you can't get any more, the inventory's out, the game's over, I don't have any more, that really fires people up and they want it even more. And so those things started kind of flywheeling there. Um, and we sold out, we sold out 17 of the first games that see like 17 out of like 25 games that first that, season. That was the first year. First year. Wow. And then we, we parlayed that into some different strategy to allow us to start selling out the future games. Wow. That's awesome, man. Yeah. yeah I mean, it's I, crazy. I, I, yeah. It's, it takes like we see now four straight seasons of sold out tickets. Like you guys are crushing it, putting out this, this content, like making the players and the fans, the celebrities of the games versus you guys. Um, and it's like, how, how, where did that start? I'm so mm -hmm. interested in like the beginning kind of startup phases. Yeah. Cause I have, I have a lot of conversations with people that want to start businesses. And, um, I had a conversation a couple of days ago with, with a guy starting a, starting a business in South Carolina. And he was like, you know, what should I be prepared for? I'm like, it is going to be hard as yep. heck the first six months, 12 months, 18 months, it's going to mm -hmm. be very hard and you are going to want to quit so many times. So that's, yeah. that's kind of like, you always see the, the overnight success, quote unquote, right. overnight successes, but they right. really are n never overnight. You know, it's, it's right. hours and hours and months of, of hard work. And, you know, it seems like you guys are, are doing things differently. And I, yeah. I, I want to touch, but so you guys name the company, is it fans first experience? Fans, fans first, first entertainment. entertainment. Yep. 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 I mean, that's, that's the whole vision. It's like, how do we put the fans first? Yeah, that's it. We're trying to bring this mentality. We're trying to bring this experience of, of what does it look like? And, and when you talk about starting a business, that's what we were starting to look at was like, what are the problems in this industry? What are the problems with baseball? What are the problems with live sports? Like, and so you start, you know, like you think about baseball, there's 160 minor league teams there's 30 whatever 30 major league teams there's however many independent teams there's however many college summer league teams there's college baseball there's high school baseball i mean like if you want to go watch a baseball game you can go tv in person little league field wherever you can go watch a baseball game so we how naive would we be to start a business and just do the same thing that everyone else is doing and pretend that we're gonna do it just a little bit better and expect these dramatic results. And so from the business, we were like, if we're gonna do this, we've gotta set out and nail one or two or three dramatically different things that's gonna to totally separate us from the rest of the crap. And so, you know, naming the company fans first, you know, we really felt like baseball games are long and slow and boring. And so as, as Walt Disney uh, used to do, we want to break the rules. We want to break the rules of our business, break the rules of our industry, break the rules of, of baseball. And so in our mindset, baseball needs to be fun and fast paced and quick and full of energy and full of entertainment. And so that guides the strategy that we put into play. And that's why we have, you know, a dancing first base coach. And that's why we have, you know, a pep band in our crowd. That's why we have, you know, a male cheerleading team. Like we have all those things because we're trying to break down the rules of the industry. And I think if, if people are setting out to do business, they've got to figure out what are those one or two or three things that I'm really just going to turn the other way on that I'm really gonna just drive against the grain, go against what's normal, go against what's expected, um, because that's the way that we feel like we can succeed, is we wanna be known as like, almost like the craft, brew, like you think about what, what, what craft beer did to, is doing to the big beer market. Like 
we kind of think of ourselves as like the craft beer of baseball teams, you know, like we want to stick it to the people who want to do it traditionally, who want to do it old school. We want to change the game. We want to mix flavors. We want to try things out. We want to try new recipes. We want to try baseball in a different way and break the rules of what's done traditionally. And I think a lot of businesses, if you can start breaking some rules, getting some attention, doing things differently, um, that's a cool place to start out. Yeah. I mean, it, it all starts with that kind of vision and forward thinking. It's like, how do I get there? Mm-hmm. You know, if you can break the chains and break the, you know, the standards and just think outside the box, like, yeah. you know, you and I both split, both played collegiate baseball. Like we have an understanding of baseball, but kind of taking a step back of like, president owner of yep. something like that is t- a total different mindset than playing the game. Yeah. And I, I think it sounds like you guys kind of took a step back at some point and like, okay, how can we do this differently? Like how, how can you and Jesse think about this different? Like how do we do baseball differently? Like it's, right. it's America's pastime. Like how did you guys even get to that point? Yeah. Like talk me through, talk me through kind of that phase. So I think what we realized was number one, like you mentioned, we played baseball. And so we're supposed to like enjoy this game and, and like it, which I do. Like, I'm not, I, I don't, it's I don't boring not, to watch. I don't not, yeah. I don't not enjoy baseball, but like it's when you, when you fall asleep watching a baseball game on TV, like something is wrong. <laughs> um, and Jesse kind of said the same thing. You know, Jesse went to Wofford and, and played ball there and um, had, had a pretty good career. And, you know, what we realized was, we can't get, and this goes for, for other businesses as well, we can't get our ideas from the baseball industry because we're just going to be regurgitating the same crap that mm-hmm. everyone else is doing. And so, and, and, and Jesse um, really had this mindset, you know, he's, he's been inspired by, you know, like P.T. Barnum and Walt Disney and, you know, people outside of the sports industry. And so when we read about, you know, companies like Southwest Airlines, and when we, when we read about companies like, you know, Apple, and we, we, we go to Disney World, and we experience these things, or, or you go on a cruise ship, you know, you go on a cruise ship, and then you take that mindset of like, all right, how could I apply what a cruise ship does to a baseball team? Could I have the same imagination or hospitality or, you know, like, like how can you start taking ideas and imagination from other industries? You know, what would it look like to be the Ritz Carlton of, you know, marketing? Or what would it be like to be, you know, the Disney world of a dentist? Or like, like what if you start <laughs> thinking about these things and it's like, all right, I'm not just a plumber. I'm not just a baseball team. I'm not just, you know, small business marketing. I can be something else and take ideas from them, still deliver my product, still deliver great service, but with a different mindset. And I think that started opening us up to like, you know, like, for example, we think of ourselves more like a theater company, more like a performance company than a baseball team. And when you take that mindset, 4,000 people in the crowd are no longer watching a baseball game. They're watching a theatrical performance. And so that means we got to hire entertainers. And that means we got to hire characters. And that means we got to do music and food differently. That totally changes the game. Um, you know, we, we, we were working with a bank one time in Kentucky, and they went to the Ritz-Carlton, uh, the, the Ritz-Carlton experience and did some really in-depth training with the Ritz-Carlton. But you think about it every bank is the same. They're all very like frustrating to work with. You never go inside because you don't want to go inside. You rarely ever call them because you don't want to call them. And they were like, we want to take the Ritz Carlton mindset and apply it to our bank. And it changes everything. You change your mindset. And when you start doing that, I think some big things can come out of it. Yeah. And I'm, I'm a big reader as most of the um, listeners know, like I, I ask a lot about reading and like book recommendations and things like that, but I don't specifically read like business only. Like I yeah. get a yeah. lot of my ideas from these like outlandish books that mm-hmm. like rich dad, poor dad, you know, yeah. that, that yeah. is like a mental 
shift. Yeah. Yes, it talks about real estate and money and all this, but it's like, okay, how do how do you relate that piece of info to yeah. what you're doing? And then how do you relate this book to what you're doing that yeah. you know has nothing to do with what you're actually doing? Like, um, yeah, I mean that that's something that I preach on a lot. It's like taking little bits of info from every piece of you know, maybe it's someone you follow, maybe it's a book you read, maybe it's a podcast, like whatever it is, like taking little bits of everything, create using, using your creativity and then putting it out in the world in your yeah. avenue with whatever, with whatever you do. So I think it, it really shows you as a different person, a different business to the people you're, you're working with. And I think that's refreshing. I think it's really refreshing. Yep. Yep. And people remember different that that's kind yeah. of the underlying thing that I'm seeing from you guys is people remember different. Like people yeah. tell other people about being different. Like yeah. we didn't go to a baseball game. We went to the Savannah Bananas. There was a all guy cheerleading team. Yeah. Like, it's like, what? Like yeah. it just sticks out to people. People remember different. You have so, to. Yeah. yeah. You got to be that. I mean, like people, yeah, like you say people remember the highs of those experiences. Like they remember what they felt like when they saw something new, when they saw something different, when they saw something for the first time, it's remarkable. And then they start sharing that. They start telling people about it, like you said. And that's really when you tap into that piece that's like, mm -hmm. how do you create the fans that are your marketing team at that point? Yep. And that's, that's something that you guys are definitely doing. It's like, how do you create people like raving fans that mm -hmm. promote your product without paying them? That's yeah. where you reach that next level. Yeah, it's it's so powerful. Word of mouth marketing is so powerful. And there there is a time and place for you know pushing your content out to more people and paying for it. But like the most powerful, inexpensive, just like oh my gosh, over the top marketing is when someone goes out and talks well about your company, your product, your business, your people. Like when you get that, like. And, and on the flip side, when they talk negatively, it's <laughs> also equally, if not more powerful. I'll, ne I'll never forget, um, my, my wife was talking to uh, th this, this other lady, and she just hinted about a bad experience she had at a, at a local car dealership. And I've never, I've, never, um, I've never looked up that car dealership. I've never done business with them, never heard anything else about it. But just that little sense of like, she had a bad experience. I don't care how many ads they send to me. I don't care how many billboards. I don't care how many, I don't care how many radio ads that one, because I trust her. I trust the girl that said it, that one little blip on my radar. I put them in the back burner Yeah. on the flip side. If she would have just said, Oh my gosh, when I went here, they did this for me. The experience was like this. I had an issue, but they fixed it immediately. It was amazing. Again, yeah. they could spend on the flip side, they could spend no more ads and I'm buying my next car yep. from them. And so we feel like instead of investing in sales and, you know, trying to find the next best, you know, uh, CRM system or like, like we want to invest in the experience. And we believe that if you invest in the customer experience and how you make people feel and the environment that you deliver for them, and the memories that you make for them, they will leave and they will talk well about you and they will no longer be customers. They will be fans of what you do and why you do it and how you do it. And they will go out and they will tell everyone they possibly can um, about your business. And what I'll say is, I think a lot of people think, okay, well, you're a baseball team, that's easy. We have met, <laughs> We have met construction workers. We have met banks. We have met law firms. We have met so many different businesses who have made this switch from just selling a product and advertising a product to creating a remarkable experience for their people and letting those people go out into the market. We've met so many different industries that are doing it. Um, and it's fun to see the results. It's really fun to see. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Um, I, I want to kind of shift gears with... The, the state of the economy, you know, everybody knows what's going on with COVID and, and uh, the coronavirus. Like, how, how are you guys doing things differently now? So just to kind of give everybody an idea, it's July 10th, um, 2020. 
for future listeners. And yeah. you, I mean, we're, we're right in the thick of this whole thing. Um, as a baseball team, the last time we spoke maybe three months ago, it had just broke that, you know, things are going to get shut down. So you guys got regulations of how you can open up the stadium. Um, and they kind of talked me through like what you guys are offering, what's your thought process, why, you know, why you did that and what you guys are doing to maximize this opportunity. Mm -hmm. I think the first thing that we did was, was we had to understand who we were for the customers and for the fans. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of businesses out there doing some really great things for people. You know, there was, there was businesses who were, you know, creating uh, hand sanitizer and, and, and creating masks and, you know, people were delivering meals to, to nurses. Like there's a lot of great things that were happening. And we were kind of looking back at ourselves like, well, what are we doing? Are, are, like, are we supposed to be delivering masks and like, you know, and, and going and delivering food and are, are we supposed to be doing these things? And what we realized was like, that's just not our sweet spot. And that's not what our people, that's not what our fans and customers expect from us. And so what we realized was we could be a driving force in continuing to provide fun and entertainment and lift people's spirits. And we felt like that was what our calling should be kind of during this whole thing. And so like nobody got a ticket sales email from us. Nobody got a merchandise sales email from like, they didn't get, you know, Hey, just because of this, you know, free shipping now, like none of that happened. But what our staff did, and we kind of challenged everybody to do this, was really double down on the fun content that we were producing. And, it, and basically, it was like limitless on the rules. No rules, just come up with stuff. And so we had staff doing like Facebook Lives once a week from their home cooking in their kitchen. And so they, you know, they put the recipe online and, you know, they're cooking and, and fans are eating it up. People are like, oh my gosh, you know, it's so cool to see you guys. And then our, um, our DJ and PA announcer, he started doing music trivia on Facebook Live every Tuesday night. Facebook, almost like 500 that is, comments, that is 600 awesome. comments. Like people just tuning in and hanging out. And we started putting out some of these other videos. And what we saw people commenting like, this, you know, this is what I needed today. Or this was the positive message I needed in my timeline or, uh, you know, really lifted me up. Like, and we were like, that's like, that's it. That's what we're trying to provide here. And so that was a big piece of it. And then on the flip side, on um, when we actually got to start understanding how we could open up the business, um, I think for us, we always, we want to be remembered as the solution providers. You know, we don't want to just sit back and hope everything goes away and you know we're not going to open back up until until the world gets back to normal like it we might not get back to normal and so what are you going to do to see this roadblock and make a pivot and change here and change direction and so we've always had this this mindset of like we've got to figure it out we want to be remembered as the people that provided solutions through this thing and so we you know we spent weeks and weeks and weeks looking through like how can we open up how can we do it safely how can we do it affordably how can we make sure that people are still having fun how can we make sure our brand is still doing the right thing and so we went through all of that and we had to push the season back a month and we had to really meet with the city and the health department and understand like all right if we're going to bring you know a thousand people together how can we do it how can we spread them out um and i'll tell you what our, our, our staff and our people really bought into this thing that we can do this. It's going to be hard. Like it's not, we said, we said from the get go, this ain't easy. You said it from the, you, you said it from the beginning of this, of this podcast, like running a business isn't easy. It's not easy to figure these things out, but it's the only way. It's the only, it's the only chance we have to survive. And so we started putting in, in things in play to figure this out. And um, we knew that it was going to be a short-term hit on the profit, a short-term hit on the revenue. You know, we're going to have a tough year this year. That's, that's without a doubt. And everyone does. Um, but long-term, how can we still be focused on building these fans, providing them great content, building our brand, pushing our, our fans first vision out there. Like we want to continue doing that. Um, and that's, that's never changed. Yeah. And you guys are, we were talking pre-show a little bit about this and I asked Jared, I was like, how, how are you using this opportunity to kind of pivot and do things a little different? And yeah. 
talk to me a little bit about that Facebook lot. So uh, just to kind of recap, you guys are still, so you're still doing games for a limited amount of audience. Um, yep. And then also you created this uh, idea of streaming the games yep. and talk me through that. Like, how has that been going? Um, and you know, how did you get to that point? It's really forced us. And I'm sure other people have felt the same way. It's really forced us to like, green light and like speed, speed light or whatever you want to call it, like <laughs> through a lot of these ideas, you know, a lot of it was like, Oh, it'd be nice to, it'd be nice to, you know, have some fun doing streaming one day. You know, that'd be, that'd be a cool idea. And you know, we, we've always wanted to do that. We always want to do this. And then we had this downtime of like, whatever, eight weeks where we had nothing going on and it really got us challenging our minds thinking about new ways we had to deliver this experience. And there's three or four things this year that have come about that I don't think we would have ever done or ever tried in normal situations. And one of them being kind of creating this uh, new virtual bananas experience. And it kind of, the, the idea came from, all right, if people can't come to my business, if people can't come to my game, if people can't come to my live event, whatever it might be, how can I take that, box it up, package it up, and bring it to them? And so we started kind of whiteboarding some ideas and what that might look like. And then through Facebook, we were able to kind of develop this platform that does that. It brings people together. It gives them new content. It gives them live streaming. It gives them community. It gives them engagement. It gives them content that they've never seen before. And so we were able to use Facebook and really spend a lot of time like, literally whiteboarding all right if we were going to charge five bucks a month for people to see our content which is that that's what we're doing what would we give them you know what kind of documentaries would they want to see what kind of giveaways would they want to see what would the streaming look like you know how could we present a baseball game on tv not the normal way and so like how can we use drones? How can we mic up all the players? How can we, you know, take cameras into the dugout and into the, you know, on, into the locker room and on the mound? And like, how can we do all those things? And I think this, this, um, this, this pandemic has forced us really to get creative. And, and that's been a fun thing that we might not have had if we, if we didn't have this opportunity. Yeah. I've, I've heard a lot of people say that is yes. You know, what's happened in the world is absolutely terrible. Like zero good has come out of it. But if you kind of shift your mind to, okay, how is this an opportunity to rethink how we're doing what we're doing in yep. business or whatever it is? Like I know a lot of businesses are, you know, forcing people to work from home. It's like, okay, right. how, how do you still like, you have to be productive, you know, you yeah. get pushed against the wall and, saying like, okay, how do I still do what I need to do in a different way now? So it's like, it's kind of a blessing in disguise. And that's kind of how I view it. We, we at Conversion Stream, we've, we've pivoted. We are literally rethinking everything that we're delivering to our customers yep. and like, okay, how is this changing everything that we're doing? Yeah. And it seems like you guys are doing the same thing, man. That's, that's absolutely awesome. Um, I, I had yeah. a couple, couple kind of questions for you and then we'll get into the rapid fire round. Um, what's your biggest failure in the past year? Mm. Biggest failure in the past year, man. I, I feel like this past year has been like this past two weeks, um, <laughs> past year. I think, I think for, for me personally is just, is really not having a firm grasp on, on personal, uh, personal leadership, you know, where, 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 where I, you know, when you start in this business and you're a doer, right, you're an executor, you're an engineer, you're doing the thing. And then over time, you know, we bring on more people. And I, I remember, uh, you know, just a few weeks ago, we had 25 people on a call, 25 people. We started with four. Now we've got 25. And I don't know if I've spent enough time, you know, developing myself to be able to lead those people where, you know, my time has got to be spent on developing our team, building our people, building our culture. And in my mind, I've always been just do, 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 you know, go, 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 do the thing, sell it, market it, mm -hmm. put it in play. Um, 
that's always been my mindset. And so I don't know if I've been able to adapt quick enough to become that personal leader that the team needs and allow them to do their job to the best of their abilities while, you know, relinquishing my day-to-day operation, my, my day-to-day duties. And so I think that's probably held us back a little bit um, from, from where we need to go. And that's what I'm working on a lot more, you know, daily, monthly, weekly is like, how can I continue to develop as a person who's leading these other people? And so I think that always sits in the back of my mind, like you got to be better at that. Yeah. And just giving people power, like Mm -hmm. empowering them to make a decision and then just, just taking a step back. Yeah. Which is not my personality type. Uh, That's neither. Not at all. I I struggle with that as well. Yeah. I struggle with that as well. And then I like beat myself up because I know I'm supposed to be doing it, but I'm fighting myself. It's, 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 it's it's a challenge. It really is. Yeah. Um, Favorite book or podcast right now? Mm, um, Favorite, favorite book. uh, I keep going back to this. I've said it. If I've said it once, I've said it a hundred thousand times. But this book is called Oversubscribed. It's by a guy named Daniel Priestley. Uh, It is what inspired us to take the next step in our sellout mentality um and he uses a million examples of businesses where customers are lining up to do business with them and he starts with some of the big ones he starts with like hey here's why people wake up at three o'clock in the morning to go buy the new iphone here's why people you know go online at midnight to buy Air Jordans. Like, here's the campaigns they run. Here's how they do it. It's really, really fun. Um, and that's what we took in, in in our business to figure out how could we get fans lining up, you know, either virtually or in person. How could we get fans lining up to do business with us? And we've taken that model and adapted it and changed it and switched it around. Um, but he runs some pretty cool stuff. Dan- Daniel Priest has got some really cool stuff. He's got a book called um, uh, Key Person of Influence, which talks about like you being the leader of your business and how you can use your influence to, to build the business. Um, he's got one called uh, 24 Assets, which talks about, you know, he basically lists out all the assets that you can have in your business, 24 of them. It's really powerful stuff. Nice, nice. So yeah, he, he's got some cool stuff. Um, podcast wise, I've, I've always, I know I normally go deep on, on podcast. I, I, I normally don't have like 50 that I listen to. Um, but there was one that just came out, uh, entree leadership podcast with, uh, Michael Hyatt. And he talks about, uh, the personal leadership and he talks about how he built his team and how he built his business. And, uh, it, it's pretty powerful. Yeah. Cool, man. Um, yeah, I always like to ask like books and podcasts, especially from people that are doing things differently like you guys are and like, what are they listening to? How are they doing it? Yep. Because, you know, success is is this great monumental thing, but it leaves clues. Like it's yep. not a, you know, a, a super in-depth thing. It's like, okay, all these companies are doing something very similar in different industries. It's like, mm-hmm. if you study those companies, read about them, you can yep. see a lot of underlying trends with that. So yep. that's, that's awesome, man. Um, so let's, let's go ahead and jump into the rapid fire round. Um, and then we'll wrap this thing up, man. You ready? Cool. Let's go for it. One thing not many people know about you. Um, <laughs> one thing not many people know about me. Um, I joke about this a lot, but my, my first job, well, I guess I guess people do know that about me. Um, go for it. I'll, I'll, my, I talk about working at Chick-fil-A a lot, but people don't really know. My, <laughs> my, fir- my first job, I was a Chick-fil-A cow. Um, <laughs> And that, I did not know that. Yeah, that really taught me like humility. Uh, you know, working working the street corner at my local Chick Fil A. Uh, I would I would count. <laughs> they did, they didn't tell me when to go in or go out, so I would have to count the stoplights. I knew how long the stoplight lasted, and so I would I would just mesmerize myself. I would count the stoplights, and I would know like, all right, it's been about thirty minutes. Time to go in. Um, but it was it was really funny. I, I enjoyed. I, I did enjoy it. And it, it did turn into to actually working at Chick-fil-A. And um, I learned a lot, actually, 
working at Chick-fil-A, you know, in high school and in college, um, and still things to this day that I bring up and remember, like, hey, here's, here's how we did it at Chick-fil-A, and those principles have always stayed with me. That's another company that is doing things differently in the fast food game. Big time, definitely. Yeah. All right. Uh, if you had an additional $10,000 handed to you right now, where would you spend it in your business? Um, either more videographers or more videography equipment, uh, for sure. I mean, just being able to capture video and be able to put it out and be able to edit it and get content out to people, um, would be pretty cool. Nice. One thing you're excited about right now. Oh man, just, just learning the digital landscape of potential products and collaborations and the way that you can like use other people's audiences to get your message out, just like you're doing right now with podcasting and like you go on someone's podcast and then that's their audience. And then you bring someone else onto your podcast and, you know, get their audience that way. And we're trying to collaborate with, you know, people, whether it be on YouTube or, you know, merchandise collaborations or like other digital collaborations, like there's some really powerful stuff out there. And, you know, your ability to get in front of someone else's audience, whether it be five people or 5,000 people or 5 million people, whatever it is, um, really starts putting you in a, in a different, different realm. And for the most part, it's all free, which is pretty cool. <laughs> what is one thing I didn't ask you, but should have, um, uh, let's see. You didn't ask, I don't know. I'm trying to think back about what you did ask. Um, Anything that you want to talk more about? I think, I think really like the, probably the one thing you didn't ask that, that does get asked a lot is like, all right, so how does this work in other businesses? You know, how, like, you know, you guys are a sports team. How, how does this work? And I think really like, it's, it's this mindset of people, like you said, people remember different. You know, if you go do your taxes today with an accountant, you're not going to go home and just, you know, brag about it to your girlfriend, wife, husband, kid. Like, you're not going to write a letter, you know, to your friends about, <laughs> guys, I just had a meeting with my accountant today. No, you're not. But if you walked into your accountant's office and they were playing, you know, top 40 music, and they were wearing Hawaiian shirts, <laughs> and, you know, they had a, a bar set out, or they had, you know, you know, they had like a petting zoo or something, like something ridiculous, um, or they were creating some viral videos of themselves in the office, you know, doing 30 second music videos or parodies, you would share that, and you would be like, all right, these guys are kind of cool. I like these guys. They're a little bit different. Um, you've got to be different. You've got to break the norm. If, if anybody is listening, if I don't know if you remember this guy, but, um, he was the, not the, not the dancing, the singing dentist. He's on YouTube. I don't know if you've ever, I have. Yes. He was just a dentist. He is a dentist, I guess. And he would just film himself in the, in the rooms singing songs. Yes. And he put it on YouTube and it blew up. I mean, you've got to set yourself apart. You've got to have an edge. You got to have a little bit, you know, something that makes you different in the marketplace. And what I'll say is it can't be, you've got a little bit cheaper price. It can't be, you've got a little bit better product and it can't be, you know, that you've got a little bit cooler brand. Like it's gotta be something totally different. And what we believe is it's the experience. It's the experience you create for people and it's the way that you make them feel when they do business with you that can totally set you apart. So um, I think that's the one big thing is like, this doesn't just mean you're a baseball team and you have a baseball stadium. You can do these things in any business. Yeah. It's like the dancing weatherman. Do you see yeah. that, the Charlotte guy? Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. I, I heard an interview with him and he was like, I, I've been dancing for 10 years. Like it's just yeah. now starting to take off. Like, yeah. 
and it's crazy. He's like, I've always been doing that. It's just right time, right place. Boom. It took yeah. off. And now yeah. he's, he is the dancing weatherman. Like that's, that's what yeah. he's branding himself as. Yeah. Uh, what is one crazy thing business has made you do? Mm. I, um, <laughs> I think it, it, in our, in our stadium or our, our company here, um, we, <laughs> We thrive on doing weird stuff. We we absolutely thrive on doing weird stuff. And I don't know if I would ever have gotten out of my comfort zone so quickly, you know, to go on camera. I mean, the, the, the first thing I think about is like some of the videos that we've filmed here of like, you know, handing out underwear to people <laughs> and, you know, doing podcasts. And, um, you know, there was a video that we, we showed just like we, I think we filmed it two or three years ago where like we were all pretending to be dogs in the office. Like I, we, I think I got my hair cut on, on video one time, like, but it's just fun. And we want to show off that culture of like, we don't take ourselves too serious. We don't take ourselves too seriously at all. Now we do good work and in business, you got to show that you're going to deliver good work. You're going to, you're going to crush it for that client or you're going to deliver a great service or you're going to deliver a great product. You can't, you can't flub on those because people will sniff you out. And if you're not yep. delivering, you're not getting hired. Nobody's yep. talking about it. So you got to maintain that. But beyond that, like you got to have fun, like business, we work 40, 50, 60 hours a week we got to make this thing fun because I think that that permeates to the team, but that also permeates to the customers. And that starts really creating a pretty cool thing when, when you think about having fun. So um, it's really allowed me to not take ourselves too seriously. Um, and I'm a pretty serious guy for the most part, but it's, it's, it's made me lighten up a lot more. And um, there's, there's definitely some things that I'm like, how did we ever get away with that? That was the weirdest thing we've ever done. That's awesome, man. Favorite app on your phone no one has heard about? Um, let me look it up. Uh, Vine. No, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> is that still a thing anymore? <laughs> yeah, not quite. Um, favorite app on my phone that nobody has heard about? Um, this, this one, this is kind of a weird one, I guess. Um, we use this... So we use this um, platform called Basecamp. It's like a, it's kind of similar to Slack, but like it's, it's a really cool thing for our whole team to be on. Um, so like Basecamp is a really cool one. That, that's like a really cool product. Um, my favorite app of all time though is the Chick-fil-A app. No, no, uh, <laughs> no, no free ads, no free ads to them, but uh, Chick-fil-A app is my favorite one. But yeah, Basecamp is a really cool one. We, we use it as a team. Basically, like it eliminates, you don't have to have like a million group texts, especially for a little bit larger team. Like you don't have a million group texts. You don't have like a million channels. Um, you don't have like a million email attachments that you file through. Like it's got file sharing. It's got, you know, chat room. It's got message boards. Like all your, it's got different teams you can be on. I found it really useful just to be able to like, you know, split your brain up into what's going on in the business. Yep. Nice. Who should I interview next in your network? Um, who should you interview next? Um, I think there's some, I think there's some interesting small business people here in Savannah that are doing some really cool things and they're thinking outside the box and they're, they're building, they're building some cool platforms. Um, and they're, they're, they're just, they're really, really good people who are, are getting outside their zone. They're, they're getting outside their niche and, and they're doing some fun things. So, you know, there's a realtor in town that does some, some fun stuff. Um, there's a, there's a HVAC company in town that I think you guys would, you, you would love them because like they're, they're all like, they're an HVAC company, but they're all remote. Um, they're like all like, they're very systems and processes oriented. Like everything is in a system organized in a process like they don't, they don't mess around. It's uh, it, it, they're, they're a cool one. Um, so yeah, I think that there's some cool people here in Savannah that are doing some, I think some remarkable things. What, who's the HVAC company? Uh, they just rebranded. They're now service emperor. 
Tersh, Tersh and Julie. Um, they crush it. They do some really cool stuff. Nice. They, Sounds like they, it. They try to, they try to uh, only like their target market is like millennials, which is like really funny for like an HVAC company. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, like they do, they do pretty much everything like through like your phone, like you schedule stuff on your phone, like you don't like call them. Very like, innovative. Yep. Yeah. They're just mixing it up. Like what it's, it's the same thing. Like whatever you, ex, whatever you would think about an HVAC company to be, they just different pivot and we're going to do the opposite. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. They target millennials. Yeah. It's really, it's a really funny conversation because he's like, I was like, so, so why, like, why, why millennials? Like, I don't know. Like I am, I am in that age group and I just feel like I can create a better business for people that I'm in that age group. Like exactly that's that he's just like, that's just what makes sense to me. So then I should just serve those people who I'm already in the same life stage with. And I was like, that's, so he's like, I, so I, he's like, I know how to create the customer experience for them. I know how to like, you know, I, I know the the technology, I know the way that they're, you know, not, not, not that he knows everything, but he's like, I know the way that people are thinking, I know the way that they behave, I know what they're talking about online. And like, I can, I can, you know, work to create that. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's awesome, man. So that was the rapid fire round. You crushed it, man. That was, that was really, really Let's valuable. Go. You passed the test. <laughs> so just wrapping up, man, um, where can people go, go online to find m- more about you and, and what you guys are doing? Yeah. I mean, we're, we're everywhere on, on, uh, online for the most part, Savannah bananas. Uh, obviously the Savannah bananas.com is, is our website and, um, we're on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, TikTok now. TikTok, yeah. Um, uh, TikTok has become the biggest platform we've yes, ever used. Let, let's before we jump off, talk to me about the TikTok. Before the show, Jared said that was becoming <laughs> the number one social platform for you guys. 40, 40 or fifty thousand people. That's following why, in what three months you said? Uh we really just started using it like we had we had I think we had five thousand followers like a few a few weeks ago. Wow. Wow. And um, I haven't been using it uh, specifically. We've just let our marketing team run with it. And um, it's, it's insane. It's absolutely insane. And people like, it's a whole new audience and it's nuts. So yeah, people can find us on there. Really funny videos, really awkward videos, uh, players dancing, all that stuff. And then um, my, my email and address and phone number is pretty much everywhere too. So online and um, people, people are pretty easy to get in touch with me. Awesome, man. The next time I'm in Savannah, I definitely need to come see you, see yes. what you guys are up to. Uh, and everyone else listening, go check them out. Um, you know, you can obviously stream all the games now, which is absolutely yeah. amazing. Yeah. Jared, man, thanks for coming on. That was fun. Thanks, Caleb. See you. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for listening to the Business Made Me Do It podcast. That was Jared Orton, the president of the Savannah Bananas. They are a uh, Coastal Plain League um, collegiate, one of the best collegiate leagues in the in the country. Um, go give them a follow, the SavannahBananas.com, and then they're across every social platform. So definitely go give them some love. Um, reach out to Jared Orton on Instagram as well. And yeah, thanks for tuning in. Cue the outro. <laughs>